In the annals of United States naval history, few ships have left as indelible a mark as the USS Enterprise, or CV-6 as she was designated. Affectionately known as the Big E, this legendary aircraft carrier played a pivotal and crucial role in United States naval operations during World War II. The Enterprise was commissioned in the mid-1930s and was one of three pre-war American carriers to survive the conflict, earning a total of 20 battle stars along the way. At one point, she was the only operational American flat top left in the Pacific theater of operations and she held the line against the Imperial Japanese Navy. Now, let's dive into the remarkable history of the USS Enterprise by exploring its construction, World War II service, and her post-war fate. The Enterprise was the second Yorktown-class aircraft carrier to be built and the sixth overall by the United States Navy. The Yorktown-class consisted of three carriers, Yorktown, Enterprise and Hornet, built in that order between 1934 and 1941. In the Yorktown-class, the U.S. Navy sought to develop aircraft carriers that were flexible and fast, while also embarking larger air groups than previous designs. This came from an analysis of the carriers built prior to the Enterprise, the Langley, Lexington. Saratoga, and Ranger. Langley was slow and only held 36 aircraft at our peak point of service, Saratoga and Lexington were fast and held 90 planes apiece but were not purpose-built designs, as both began life as battle cruisers, and the Ranger was deemed too small and not fast enough upon entering service. The Navy also wanted the Yorktown class to be better protected from the threat of torpedoes than the previous ships were. The Yorktowns were built under the terms and limitations of the Washington Naval Treaty, which limited the United States' total aircraft carrier tonnage to 135,000 tons. Originally, the Navy planned to build three, 17,000-ton carriers, but realized quite early on in the process that this design would not achieve their desired high operating speed, protection and air group capacity requirements. They chose to go instead with two, 19,000-ton carriers that could fully meet all of their desired requirements. And while the Yorktowns would have a smaller displacement than the Lexington class's 27,000 tons, they would be equipped with similar machinery and have the same amount of hull volume and flight deck space. This would result in a versatile design that could achieve 32.5 knots with improved durability, as Enterprise would later show during the Pacific War, and be capable of operating over 80 aircraft despite being 8,000 tons smaller than Lexington and Saratoga, both of whom operated around 80 aircraft themselves. Enterprise was ordered by the U.S. Navy in 1933 and her keel was laid down on July 16, 1934 at the Newport News Shipbuilding Company, in Newport News, Virginia. When completed, Enterprise would have an overall length of just over 809 feet, a beam of 108 feet and displace 19,800 tons. When fully loaded, she would displace 25,500 tons. Her flight deck at the time of commissioning was 802 feet long and almost 110 feet wide. She was propelled by nine Babcock and Wilcox boilers which produced and sent 120,000 standard horsepower to her four Parsons geared steam turbines and her four propeller shafts. This produced a top speed of 32.5 knots and a range of 12,500 nautical miles at 15 knots. Enterprise was protected by an armor belt that was two and a half inches thick, with four inches covering her steering gear compartments. Initially, for air defense, she would be equipped with eight, five-inch, 38 caliber guns located in single mounts in the catwalk along the sides of the ship. She also had four, 1.1 inch Chicago piano mounts and 24, 50 caliber machine guns. This armament would prove to be ineffective against air attacks in the early days of the Pacific War and she, like all U.S. ships, would have her Chicago pianos and machine guns replaced with both for 40 mm mounts and Orlikon 20 mm mounts. She would retain her 5 inch, 38 caliber mounts throughout the entirety of her career. Enterprise had three aircraft elevators and two hydraulic catapults for launching aircraft and she would carry 90-plus aircraft. She also had a hangar deck catapult that was subsequently removed in late June of 1942. Enterprise would be equipped with the CXAM-1 radar system in 1941 and later on would have SK Air Search and SM Fighter Direction radars added. As designed, Enterprise would be manned by 2,217 officers, enlisted personnel and aircrews in 1941. Eventually, this would grow to 2,919 later in the war. Enterprise would be launched on October 3, 1936 and commissioned on May 12, 1938. After commissioning, she would sail to South America for her shakedown cruise, which would have her make a port call at Rio de Janeiro. After returning from her shakedown cruise, she would operate along the east coast of the United States and in the Caribbean until April 1939, 
when she was ordered to the Pacific where she would initially be based in San Diego. During her time in San Diego, the Enterprise would be used to film the 1941 movie, Dive Bomber. In April of 1940, the Enterprise would change her home port to the forward base at Pearl Harbor on the Hawaiian island of Oahu after President Roosevelt ordered the fleet to relocate due to rising tensions in the Pacific with the Japanese. Here, the carrier and her air group would train intensively during 1940 and 1941. On November 28, 1941, the Enterprise departed Pearl Harbor with Task Force 8 for a 2,500-mile trip to deliver Marine Fighter Squadron VMF-211 to Wake Island. She was scheduled to return to Hawaii on December 6, but was delayed by bad weather, and she was still at sea about 250 miles west of Oahu at dawn on December 7. Enterprise received radio messages from Pearl Harbor reporting that the base was under attack and launched 18 SBD Dauntless dive bombers to search an arc extending from the northeast to southeast of the ship. They flew on to Pearl Harbor after completing their search routes. As the aircraft arrived over Pearl Harbor, they were caught between the attacking Japanese aircraft and defensive anti-aircraft fire from the ships and shore installations below. Seven SBDs were shot down, either from enemy action or friendly fire, with the loss of eight airmen killed and two wounded. Enterprise would also launch a strike, based on inaccurate reports of the Japanese fleet, to the southwest of her location, but they would not encounter the enemy. Enterprise would slip into Pearl Harbor on the evening of December 8 to refuel and resupply, a process that would normally take 24 hours, but was completed in seven hours on orders from Admiral William F. Halsey. Task Force 8 would proceed to patrol Hawaiian waters for the next several weeks against any possible follow-up attack by the Japanese. During this time, Enterprise pilots would sink their first enemy ship of the war, and the first enemy ship overall by the U.S. Navy, when they sank the Japanese submarine I-70 on December 10. During the rest of December, and into January, the Enterprise would protect the Hawaiian Islands and convoys heading to reinforce Samoa. During February and March of 1942, she would conduct a series of raids throughout the Central Pacific in the Marshall and Marcus Islands, and at Wake Island. Her pilots would destroy numerous aircraft on the ground and installations, while also sinking several smaller Japanese warships. After minor repairs at Pearl Harbor, Enterprise and Task Force 16 departed on April 8, 1942 to rendezvous with her sister ship Hornet. She would escort Hornet and provide air cover for the Doolittle Raid, where Hornet would launch 16 Army B-25 Mitchell bombers to bomb Tokyo. Due to this engagement, both Enterprise and Hornet would miss the Battle of the Coral Sea in early May. On May 28, Enterprise departed Pearl Harbor as Rear Admiral Raymond A. Spruance's flagship, with orders from Admiral Nimitz, to hold midway and inflict maximum damage on the enemy. On May 30, Task Force 16 would rendezvous with Task Force 17 containing the USS Yorktown. During the next several days, the Enterprise and her air group would play a big role in turning the tide of the Pacific War in the direction of the Allies. Her torpedo squadron would suffer heavy losses but her dive bombers would sink two Japanese carriers, a cruiser and help sink a third carrier with planes from Yorktown. Enterprise would make it through the battle with no damage and return to Pearl Harbor on June 13. After a month of rest and refit, the Enterprise would set sail for the South Pacific on July 15, 1942, where she would support the amphibious landings in the Solomon Islands. On August 24, a Japanese force, including carriers, was detected 200 miles to the north of Guadalcanal. In the ensuing Battle of the Eastern Solomons, a Japanese light carrier was sunk, and the Japanese troops intended for Guadalcanal could not land on the island. Enterprise took three direct bomb hits and four near misses, which inflicted serious damage on the carrier and killed 74 men and wounded 95 more. Quick, courageous work by damage control parties patched her up so that she was able to return to Pearl Harbor under her own power. She would be at Pearl Harbor for repairs from September 10 through October 16. It was during this time that she would embark Air Group 10, comprising the legendary fighter squadron VF-10, better known as the Grim Reapers. Enterprise would once again head back to the South Pacific in the sea around the Solomons. On October 26, her scout planes uncovered a Japanese carrier force northwest of the Santa Cruz Islands. In the ensuing battle, the Enterprise would again be hit by Japanese bombs, this time too, that would again cause significant damage and kill 44 men while wounding 75 more. Despite her damage, she remained in action and took on board a large number of planes and crewmen from Hornet when that carrier was sunk by Japanese planes. The loss of Hornet meant Enterprise was at that point the only functioning, albeit damaged, U.S. carrier in the Pacific theater. 
Enterprise needed repairs but the continuing thrust into the Solomons during the early part of November 1942 by the IJN required her to be present, even if she had diminished capabilities. Round-the-clock efforts by her crew and by the 75 CBs that had been ordered aboard, would get her right in time for the next Japanese advance. This would come at the Naval Battle of Guadalcanal from November 13th through the 15th, and even though she would not have a major role in what would end up being primarily a surface engagement, her aviators would sink one of the casualties of the battle, the Japanese battleship EA, as she lay dead in the water the day after the nighttime engagement. After this, the carrier would return to her base in New Caledonia for more permanent repairs to her battle damage. In early December she would head back into the Solomons to provide air cover for an American cruiser destroyer group during the Battle of the Rennell Islands on January 29 and 30. In July of 1943, with the new Essex-class fleet carriers and Independence-class light carriers joining the fleet in large numbers, Enterprise would be sent stateside to the Puget Sound Naval Yard for a much-needed overhaul. Over the course of the next several months, she would receive an extensive refit, which included the new SM fighter direction radar, both for 40mm and Orlikon 20mm mounts and an anti-torpedo blister that significantly improved her underwater protection. She would head back to the fleet for operations in early November. Enterprise would support and provide close air support for the Army's 27th Infantry Division when they attacked Macon Atoll from November 19 to the 21st. During the Gilbert Islands campaign, the Enterprise introduced carrier-based night fighters to the Pacific Theater. Unfortunately, this would result in the loss of the U.S. Navy's first fighter race, Butch O'Hare, during a nighttime engagement on November 26. In January of 1944, Enterprise would be assigned to the Fast Carrier Task Force, or Task Force 58, and would participate in the Marshall Islands campaign from late January until early February then would participate in the attack on the Japanese naval base at Truck Lagoon in the Caroline Islands on February 17, 1944. Here, she launched the first night bombing attack from a U.S. carrier using radar. The 12 torpedo bombers in this strike achieved excellent results, and accounted for nearly one-third of the 200,000 tons of shipping destroyed by U.S. aircraft over a two-day period. Enterprise would be detached from Task Force 58 after this action and would support the Army operations of General Douglas MacArthur until rejoining Task Force 58 in late March. April and May would see further strikes against Japanese bases from the Carolines to New Guinea. In June, she would sail with the Fast Carrier Task Force to support the amphibious landings in the Mariana Islands. She participated in the Battle of the Philippine Sea from June 19 to June 20 in which her pilots and air crews defended the fleet from Japanese air attacks and also contributed to the early evening attack on the Japanese fleet on the 20th. During the chaotic after-dark recovery of the airstrike, a fighter and a bomber both managed to land simultaneously, but fortunately did not cause an accident on the carrier's flight deck. She would continue to provide air support off Saipan until July 5, when she would sail for Pearl Harbor and a month of rest and refit. During this refit period, Enterprise would be painted in the classic Measure 33 Dazzle camouflage. Enterprise would be back in action in late August conducting carrier strikes with the Fast Carrier Task Force. This would be the routine for much of September and October as the fleet shifted its focus onto the Philippines and the landings that would happen there later in the month. Air strikes during this time would be conducted against the Philippines, Formosa, and Okinawa. She would participate in the Battle of Leyte Gulf from October 23 to the 26th with her aviators attacking all three Japanese task forces during the battle. More patrolling and airstrikes followed this, until December, when she headed back to Pearl Harbor. Rejoining the fleet in late December, Enterprise would strike targets from the Philippines to the Japanese home islands. In mid-February, she would support the Marines on Iwo Jima, and at one point, kept planes over the island continuously for 174 hours. After this, she would continue night raids on the home islands and receive light damage from a bomb hit on March 18. Then on April 11, she was struck by a kamikaze off Okinawa. Her forward elevator was blown over 400 feet into the air by the force from the explosion of the plane and its bomb. She would return to the fray in early May and once again be struck by a kamikaze on May 14, 1945, this time causing significant damage by destroying her forward elevator and killing 13 men and wounding 68 more. Enterprise sailed for the Puget Sound Navy Yard, where she underwent repairs and an overhaul from June until August 1945. She was still stateside on September 2, 1945 when the war officially ended. By the end of the war, Enterprise had earned 20 battle stars and her planes and guns had downed 911 enemy planes, sunk 71 ships, damaged or destroyed 192 more, 
and the Japanese had reported sinking her up to three times, earning her the nickname of the Grey Ghost. She would participate in Operation Magic Carpet and return over 10,000 veterans in her final service to her country. With that being done, she would be decommissioned on February 17, 1947 and placed into the reserve fleet. In 1946, she had been scheduled to be handed over to the state of New York as a permanent memorial, but this plan was suspended in 1949. Subsequent attempts were made at preserving the ship as a museum or memorial, including by Admiral William Halsey, but all fundraising efforts failed to raise enough money to buy the vessel from the Navy. Enterprise was sold on July 1, 1958 to the Lipset Corporation of New York City for scrapping at Kearney, New Jersey, and her scrapping was complete by May of 1960. A very tragic end for one of the most remarkable and prodigious ships to ever serve in the United States Navy. Thank you for watching, and if you enjoyed this video please hit the like button, comment and subscribe so that we can bring you more insightful content just like this.